Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, when I, I read this passage in Thessalonians for the first time in a while, I was struck by what a perfect summary it is of our faith, of what we believe, of what we hope, and how important that reminder is. The Christian message is right here, and it's such good news. It offers hope. It's not a vague feeling that all will be well, no offense to Julian of Norwich, but real solid hope, actual promises from God that he will not fail to keep. There's a danger in talking like that, though. The danger of pretending life is more predictable than it is. All of us here in this sanctuary know that losing someone we love can be very unpredictable, and it hurts a great deal. And if you've ever sat with someone who is dying, or woken up a family at 3 a.m. to tell them their loved one is dead, as I have, perhaps died in an accident or taken their own life, you know that grief is painful and all too real. It's a physical as well as an emotional pain. Our faith understands that. Jesus understands that. But in saying that, Jesus offers real hope. He's not asking us to pretend it doesn't hurt. He knows it hurts. It hurt him when Lazarus died, died as we've just heard. What he does do, though, is he offers hope in the midst of grief. And Paul understood that very well. Today's reading is a, a letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Thessalonica. That's a town in northern Greece. It's now called Thessaloniki, and it's Greece's second city. It's a big place, and it was important back then as well. The verses we heard at 13 to 18 came about because some of the Christians in the church had recently died. And Paul said this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. So he's not saying that he doesn't want them to grieve. But he doesn't want them to grieve without hope. He wants them to have hope as they mourn. And that's not easy. Paul goes on to explain that the hope that is offered to them is all tied up with when Jesus returns. I think we need to go back a little way for a wee summary of what they knew and what we know. Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday, then rose to life again on Easter Sunday. He was seen alive for a period of 40 days before visibly going back up to heaven. But he promised many times that one day he would come back. And when he does so, the most wonderful life imaginable would begin on earth for everyone who trusts and follows him. A life free of pain and suffering. A life where we can enjoy this good world. We can enjoy one another's company, enjoy the best food and drink, and live productive, happy lives without anything to spoil them. And all the early Christians, they certainly looked forward to Jesus coming back. It was the hope they lived for. But disaster had struck. Some of these Christians had died. It's painful enough to lose someone you love, but it was doubly raw in their case. Those who had died would now miss out on the return of Jesus. They died before it happened. But Jesus never said he would return soon. In fact, he said that nobody knew, knows when that will happen. But nevertheless, the Thessalonian Christians felt betrayed. Jesus had waited too long. Some of their loved ones would now miss out when the day they're all longing for arrives, when Jesus himself arrives. But Paul doesn't want these Christians to grieve like others who have no hope. There is hope, as Paul reminds them. Two things will happen to those who have died as followers of Jesus when he comes back. First, they'll come back to life. Here's verse 14. Paul says, We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. He's talking about people who have died knowing Jesus. But fallen asleep in him, that's a strange phrase. 
In our day, we, we talk about putting pets to sleep. We don't like to talk about death. So we find ways to avoid saying the word. Paul uses the word sleep for another reason. He explains further on, it's in verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The return of Jesus will be a noisy affair. Nobody will miss it. You'll hear three things. First, a loud command as Jesus commands everyone to wake up. Second, you'll hear the voice of the archangel. You'll hear the head angel talking. And third, you'll hear the trumpet call of God as God himself blows a long blast on his trumpet. All of that noise will lead to an amazing thing happening. The dead in Christ will rise, says Paul. All who have died knowing Jesus will come back to life. They'll wake up. So now we see why Paul called them those who have fallen asleep. Because one day, they'll wake up. The second thing is, we'll be with Jesus. Here's what happens next. Paul goes on. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's a lovely picture. Those of us who are still alive at the time will be scooped up with those who have just come back to life. And together, we and they will go to meet Jesus. And that meeting will happen in the clouds, in the air. Some people call this the rapture. But we can only wonder if that's what it will be like. Jesus clearly taught that he is coming back to this earth, not just to the sky. And he also taught that the ultimate future is of life together on a renewed earth. You know, if you go to meet someone off a train or at the airport, there are lots of people there, maybe waiting to meet relations or friends or business people, and you're peering through the crowd for the person you've gone to meet. Finally, you spot them, and they're halfway across the room. If it's someone you've longed to see more than anything else, then this is the most joyful moment in your life. You'd run with your arms wide open, a grin on your face as fast as you can to meet them. And then you'd walk back together to the exit, to the car park, filled with joy and love and catching up with their stories. What a marvelous feeling. <clears throat> Jesus will come back down out of heaven. Those who died knowing him will be raised to life. And then we and they will not stay rooted to the spot for way to, to wait for him to get here. Somehow, miraculously, we'll be taken up to him to meet him on the way down the best day of our lives. And then Paul's sentence sums up how wonderful this will be. And so we will be with the Lord forever. It will be a double reunion. We'll be reunited with the Lord's people that we've had to say goodbye to, our unforgotten friends and loved ones. And we'll be reunited with Jesus himself. And the reunion will go on forever. The reading ends with this sentence, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Life is tough. We know this. And so many in our community are enduring real hardship right now through bereavement and other issues. The pressure is real. Grief hurts. So it's easy to lose sight of the real hope there is. And we need every opportunity to be encouraged by these wonderful truths. It's one reason why hearing and reflecting on Paul's words is so necessary in good times and bad. We need each other to encourage us to keep our eyes on the hope that Jesus holds out to us. The Thessalonian Christians did not need to worry about those of their number who had died. They wouldn't miss out. Jesus will come back. Those who have died in him will be raised. We will be together with them again, and we'll live with Jesus forever. Grief will still come our way, but because of Jesus, we do not need to grieve like those who have no hope. Amen. <laughs>